What's up, y'all? I am live. As you can tell, I am outside probably for the last time we'll be able to do that this year. PDT here, PDT here for your weekly live prophetic word. Now, here's what I want to say. First thing I want to say is uh, I was here last week. I was here on uh, last week. What happened was Facebook wouldn't let me get on live, so I had to end up uploading the video to YouTube. I couldn't even upload the video to, to Facebook. So I was having internet problems last week, but my uh, prophetic word is here for last week. It's called No Good, and that was Sunday, November 1st. It's No Good, so it's on my Facebook Live page, okay? So scroll back up on the page, and you can find it, okay? All right, so uh, if I'm having te technical difficulties or if I'm on late, I'm not on at 2.30, right on the dot or anything like that happens, then just stay on the page for a minute. You know, I try to come on early because I've noticed that if I come on late and, uh, you know, y'all think I'm not coming, that's not true. But if something does happen and I have extreme te technical difficulties and I can't get on, then I'll find a way to upload the video because I want the prophetic word to go out. Because remember, I need your likes and your shares and your financial contributions and your shares uh, every week. Lisa said, I'm good, great, I'm glad you can hear me. So yeah, so I need you to, I need that every week, just like any other ministry, because uh, you know, I'm out here uh, I'm doing it, trying to be obedient to the Lord and trying to be sure that people, hey, there's my sister. Uh, hey says to be sure that people get uh, the prophetic word. So I'm hunching over so you can hear me because I know there's a lot of, background traffic, but we got to do what we got to do. And it's really funny because it kind of coincides with this week's prophetic word. So again, remember, if I'm not right on at 2.30, stay on the page, I'm coming. I might be having technical difficulties, which is why I try to get on early now. But if you don't see me, then check back later because I will have uploaded the video some kind of way. Again, last week, Facebook would not let me on at all. And I couldn't upload the video at all. So I had to put it on YouTube, but it is there. So last week's prophetic word is entitled, No Good. Sunday, November 1st, it's entitled, No Good. Lisa said, you give me nice and clear. Great. Okay, so let's jump into. So good to be able to talk without my mask on, too, because, you know, i got to wear my mask on all the time, but I had to take it off for this, which is so good. So this week's prophetic word, we're going to jump right in. So let's say a word of prayer, and we'll be on it. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you understand all things. Thank you that you are God that never changes. Thank you that your word is our anchor and that we're going to have to turn loose everything that's not from you <laughs> to make it in this life. Uh, breathe through me, speak through me, oh God. Take over my body, my mind, my heart, my hand gestures, everything about me, oh God, and let your word be spoken. And let the people around me looking at me right now that think I'm crazy, let them be moved by the prophetic word as they hear it too. Oh God, I thank you for it. I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right. Today's live prophetic word out here in front of Starbucks Coffee. Today's live prophetic word is entitled Looking Crazy. What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? I said the prophetic word is entitled Looking Crazy. Looking Crazy. So obviously I need to explain what I mean by that. So we're going to jump right in. Long story short, you need to understand that you cannot possibly follow God all the way and not look crazy at some point. And the Spirit of God wanted me to deliver this message to encourage those of you that are at a crossroads or you're at a point in your life where, where you're trying to launch out. So say, for example, you're the first woman trying to do something. Or let's say you're the first person of color trying to do something. Or let's say... You're trying to accomplish something that's out of sync, people think, at least with your age. Well, let's say you're trying to pioneer something. Let's say you're trying to do something that's never been done before. Well, let's say you come up with an idea that you're bringing to the market and the market has never seen a product or a service like what you're planning on offering. Or let's say the Lord has given you a word that's in line with the scriptures, but it's not something that people really talk about that much. So, you know, people come out of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Psalms and First and Second Samuels. And let's say God gives you something out of Zephaniah. Let's say God gives you something out of Habakkuk. Okay. 
you cannot follow God all the way and at some point not look crazy. But remember, that's look crazy to people. But I'm speaking to those of you both now that are listening to me live and those of you that are going to be watching this in the future, because that's one of the things I learned about dealing with God. You don't know who's listening at you. You don't know who's watching you. And you don't know who's going to watch your stuff in the future. Could be 10 years from now. But whoever's watching this video or at whatever point in time you're watching it, you might be out there on God's word. You might be out there on a unique idea. You might be out there uh, doing something, believing God or trying to start something that there's no precedent for, that everybody around you keeps telling you, you can't do that. Or you might be at a crossroads. <clears throat> do you know what it's like to be at a crossroads? Being at a crossroads means that whatever my life was up to this point, I don't want to do that no more. <laughs> whatever my life was, I want to write a new script. People might have known me a certain way all up until this point, but I hit this point and I said, <coughs> when I go forward, I don't want to be that anymore. Okay? And there's no in the way in the world that people ain't going to think you crazy. I stopped by to tell you that this is not a strange event. So I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged because this is a part of following God. When people look at you, they look at you with human vision. Okay, but they don't understand that you see with God vision. One more time. When people look at you, whatever they're talking about, they're talking about human vision. When you're dealing with God, you're dealing with God vision. And that's very, very different. Okay. So let me give you some examples from the scripture. You see what I'm talking about. Before we go to the scriptures, I need a precedent. Uh, I need to proceed that with this. <coughs> we need to stop, and I have personally pledged to stop. We need to stop talking about Bible stories as if they were stories, okay? They're not stories. They're not fairy tales. They're not fables. They're real people with real lives with things that they went through number one. But number two, one of the greatest mistakes that is made, and I got into a little bit of a disagreement with a children's church teacher about this one time, because she asked me to come in and speak to the kids. And I spoke to them about Noah, except I told the truth. I told what happened, why God flooded the world, why God killed us, and what that experience must have been like to see you looking through the ark windows and everybody around you is drowning. And you in that ark with all them animals. So I told the truth. And she freaked out. She freaked out. The, the kids were kind of like, oh, we don't know about that. Because they didn't want me doing stuff like that. Because they didn't want me telling that much truth. Because I told the truth about what it must have been like to be Noah. And what they wanted was the story. You know, they wanted the rocket in the road, the splishing and the splashing. Going in the ark, two by two. That's what they wanted. That ain't what happened. It wasn't like that. OK, it wasn't like that at all. That was not the experience of Noah and his family when they saved the world from the wrath of God. OK, what if God called you to do something like that? What if God told you there was an apocalyptic event and God told you a year before it happened that you were going to have to take your family and go into a bomb shelter? What would everybody around you say? They would say that you was crazy. All your relatives, all your friends would say, you crazy, you out your mind at a bomb shelter. And you know that the Lord showed you that the world's about to end and he's trying to save you, trying to save you and your family. And you had to go somewhere. That's what it was like being Noah. You understand that? OK, so let's uh, look at more Bible examples and let's look a little bit more closely. <coughs> Example number one. Romans 4 and 19, Romans in the New Testament says without weakening in his faith, he acknowledged the decrepitness of his body since he was about 100 years old and the lifelessness of Sarah's womb. That's talking about Abraham and Sarah. Now, I want you to get this picture, okay? First of all, Abraham uh, was 75 years old when God first called him, and his wife Sarah was 65 years old. But they didn't have their son Isaac until Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. So what the Bible is talking about in, in Romans 4.19 is not some type of deep spiritual revelation. It's talking about a practical, physical experience of Abraham not being able to perform sexually anymore because he's 100 years old. His body didn't work sexually anymore. And Sarah being way past menopause, way past menopause, she wasn't releasing any more eggs. She wasn't ovulating. She was way past 
that time in her life. She 90. Okay? And that's when God chose to give them a baby. That's how your faith started with an older couple having a baby. That's where uh, Jews, uh, Muslims, and Christians all come from is Abraham. And all of that happened for, for Jews and Christians because Muslims come from Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael. But all that happened from Jews and Christians because Abraham received strength to be able to make love to his 90-year-old wife and conceive a child. You can't tell me that when God told Abraham he was going to be the father of many nations, he thought that meant they was going to start having lots of kids. That's not what happened. It did happen because we're Abraham's children, but it probably didn't happen like they thought. <coughs> God waited until that body didn't work no more reproductively and gave that man strength to father a child and gave that woman strength to conceive a child. And I want you to imagine going through labor and you 90. Don't you know that in most cases, generally women have a smaller amount of calcium in their bones than men do, generally. Now we know that's not true in every case, but generally speaking, that's why women tend to have higher rates of osteoporosis as they age because the calcium content in the bones of females tend to be lower, just like the muscle mass and definitely the levels of testosterone. So that means that many times as a senior, if you fall and break a limb, that change or like break a leg, that changes your entire quality of life. So I want you to understand that Sarah is 90 years old, going through labor. Just just let that sink in. Having that 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 cervix dilate to 10 centimeters and having that those contractions on that womb so she, she could push Isaac out. She 90. You have anybody in your family that's 90? Big mama, Auntie T. You know, cousin Laquita and them, you got anybody in your family that's 90? That's how old Sarah was when she had Isaac. You can't tell me that folks didn't look crazy. You can't tell me that the people that knew them, because what do we do when we see people? We imagine them having sex. If Abraham walked in your church, a 100-year-old man with his 90-year-old wife and a newborn, you would be like, oh, is that your grandbaby? Is that your great-grandbaby? Abraham would be like, no, that's my son. You'd be like, what? And Sarah would be giggling, tee hee, that's my son. You're like, Sam, 90. You'd be like, ew. Yes, you would. Don't even try to act like that ain't what you do. Yes, you would. Because you would imagine an older couple having sex, you would imagine a lot of things. Okay? Because you can't follow God without looking crazy. Sometimes that's how our faith started by a senior couple having a baby, Jews and Christians. That's how we started. Do you understand that? Okay, let's go to our next example. Our next example is what I already talked about before, Noah. <coughs> Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in godly fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Okay, let me put that in simple terms. In simple terms, what that means is that because Noah acted on what God said, because Noah believed God, that's what put him in line to inherit the promises, to inherit all the things that God blessed him with. And that's what put Noah in a position to be in the same position Adam was in. Because when Noah came out of the ark, God told him to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Same thing he told Adam. Okay? The only reason Noah got to that was because he believed God and built the ark to the saving of his soul, his family. But the Bible also says he condemned the world. What does that mean? What that means is that God saw that did nobody else believe him. That's why he wiped us all out. He wiped us all out because well, nobody on earth think about God but Noah. I want you to think about that. Think about it. Nobody on the entire planet, nobody on the entire planet, nobody on the entire planet is thinking about the Lord but you and your family. And he tells you to build a submarine in your backyard. I'm just going to let that sink in. You out there every day talking about people talking about is that old man Noah? Yeah, what he doing? I don't know. Look, look like some kind of boat or something. What he doing? He cray cray. You can't tell me that people wouldn't think you was crazy using your backyard building a submarine. And he preached and preached and preached and preached and told the people it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain. It's like, oh, old man Noah, you crazy? Get out of here with that rain stuff. And show sure up, show sure up. The day came when the rain came. But remember, the Bible says that when Noah got in the heart. The Bible says that the Lord sealed the ark. 
That means that God shut the door. That means that Noah and them couldn't have opened the door if they wanted to. I want you to imagine looking out that window on that ark and everybody you know is drowning. Men, women, babies, children, teenagers, young, old, seniors, military, civilian, farmers, teachers, you name it. They're drowning, they're, they're in that water, gurgling, drowning until they stop moving. And you watch that all through, the, through that. And the only thing separating you from that is the wood in that ark. For 40 days, imagine walking around in there with all them carnivorous animals, with the tigers and the bears and the wolves and the coyotes and the lions, meat eaters. Where'd you feed them? That means no one had to bring enough lambs and bring enough goats to preserve the lambs and the goats, but also to feed the carnivores. How did he feed them? Did he open the cage and feed them? Did he drop it in like Jurassic Park? No one had to deal with all that. Can you imagine the light had to be artificial? Can you imagine sitting in the dark, listening to carnivorous animals growling while you're trying to sleep? Can you imagine all that? That's what happened to Noah. That was his experience. So no wonder when he came out to art, he got lit. I'm not saying he should have got lit. I'm just saying I understand. Because <laughs> the Bible says when Noah came out to ark, he built the altar, he burnt some sacrifice to God, then he went in his tent, he got drunk. He got, he got blackout wasted. He was naked on his bed, on his back. Because how can you go through an experience like that and not be traumatized? That's why I keep trying to tell you, these are not stories. These are people, okay? And we have done people a disservice in Sunday school, watering these events down, trying to minimize them because of, for whatever reason. Yeah, no. That's why people don't fear God, because you don't understand what really happened, okay? You can't tell me no one look. Noah's the craziest looking person in the Bible. And nobody in the Bible look crazier than Noah. Okay, we're going to go to our next example. Next example. All right. Acts 13, 22. After removing Saul, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my, carry out my will in its entirety. Now, people always amaze me when they talk about King David because they always say he was a man after God's own heart. That's true, but they don't finish the verse. Okay, the scripture says he was a man after God's own heart, and God said, he shall fulfill all my will. So in other words, what God said of David is that he's going to do everything I need a king to do. That's why God picked David. Not just because David was after God's heart. Some people think that means David had a heart like God, and some people think that means that David chased God's heart. Either way, okay, it doesn't just say that about him. God said, he shall fulfill all my will. That's in stark contrast to King Saul. King Saul was the king before David. And the reason God removed him is because Saul did a little bit of what Saul wanted and a little bit of what God wanted. And a little bit of the spirit and a little bit of the flesh. <coughs> and a little bit of what God said and a little bit of what the people said. And a little bit of what God thought and a little bit of what he thought. And God got sick of that. That's why God removed King Saul. Then he picked his own king and said, this man gonna do everything I want a king to do. That's what God was God's testimony of David. And we know that David had flesh out of control. David had like eight wives. And then David committed adultery with Bathsheba and he committed murder. He murdered all those men in Uriah's garrison just to get Uriah. He took Bathsheba to the mansion. David did a lot of wrong stuff. He had flesh out of control. He had self-control issues. But God picked him anyway. Why is that so important? Because a lot of Christians have a past. A lot of Christians have done things in their past that they're not proud of, okay? And you either did it before you got saved or you got saved, but you were still a baby Christian and you were still walking in carnality or you still, you weren't fully obedient to God, okay? And people will always say that you are not worthy to serve the Lord because you did this. Child, she ain't no evangelist. Uh-huh, Sister Viola, I knew her when she was Sister VJ. Uh-huh, she evangelist Johnston now. Uh-huh, you know, and they're always talking about who you used to be or what you used to do. It's nice if you're somebody in the Bible like Joseph or somebody in the Bible like Daniel or somebody in the Bible like Job that had strong character and integrity from the time you were young. But them ain't the only people in the Bible. They ain't the only people that God used. God used some people in the Bible that had passed 
They came out of crazy backgrounds that did some crazy things. And remember that God picked David before he committed adultery and murder. God knew David was going to do that, and he picked him anyway. Now, do you see how that just sounds crazy to people? You would not pick an ex-murderer to write the first five books of the Bible. And for those of you that don't know, Moses, who wrote, uh, Jewish people call it the Torah. We call it the Pentateuch. Mo Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Moses killed a man when he was 40 years old. But when Moses was a baby, his mama put him in a basket and sent him down the river so he didn't get murdered with other Hebrew children. And Moses grew up actually as an Egyptian. He was adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. So Moses actually had a mixed heritage. He was Hebrew, but he was raised Egyptian. Well, when he was 40 years old, he saw the Hebrews as slaves out in the field getting persecuted. And he went and fought one of the Egyptians that was whipping that man, and he killed him. And then Moses said, oh, Lord, I done killed the man. They're going to find this out. And he ran. And then Moses went to Midian, and he spent 40 years building his whole entire separate life from his old life in Egypt and what God wanted him to do. And when God caught up with Moses again, Moses was 80 years old. Eight, zero, 80 years old. Now, I want you to imagine. See, President Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter is about 94 or 95. That's the age range Moses was in when he did everything he's famous for. Part in the Red Sea, the 10 plagues of Egypt, the frogs, the lice, the hailstone, the water turning to blood, death of the firstborn, the exodus out of Egypt, spoiling the Egyptians, pillar cloud by day, fire behind, part of the Red Sea, Pharaoh drowning in the Red Sea, water out of the rock, manna from heaven, quails from the ocean. All that happened in Moses' life between 80 and 120. He's in the same age range that Jimmy Carter is right now. That's how old Moses was when he did everything Moses is famous for. <laughs> and what he did was a young man was murder somebody. Can you imagine Moses being 80-something years old, climbing Mount Sinai, trying to talk to God face to face? Lord, this wind's blowing up my hood. Uh, climbing Mount Sinai, trying to talk to God face to face, talking about, man, I sure wish I did this when, it, when I was a young man. He 80, 90, 100 years old, doing everything Moses is famous for. Happened between 80 and 120. You can't tell me he didn't look crazy. You can't tell me sometimes he didn't think he was crazy. And you can't tell me that God doesn't use people that have a past. Moses was a murderer. Do you understand that? And King David hadn't even committed adultery and murder yet before God anointed him to be king, and God picked him anyway. So some of y'all are dealing with baggage. Some of y'all are dealing with stuff from your past, or maybe people are trying to bring up some stuff from your past or whatever. That doesn't mean that God didn't choose you. That doesn't mean that God can't use you. That doesn't mean that you're not saved. Other people are going to say that. Other people are going to say that unless you got every I and cross every T that you're not a Christian. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's okay to live that way. And I'm not saying that you're not going to get consequences because you will. Okay? And you will get judged. That ain't what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that if the Lord has given you the green light to live your destiny and live your dream, then go ahead on and live it. And as far as a lot of people are concerned, you gonna look crazy. Let me give you another example. Uh, another example is uh, Apostle Paul, okay? Now, if you don't know anything about Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul was a Christian killer. Before Apostle Paul became Apostle Paul, his name was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Hebrew, he was a Pharisee, he was, a, was a, a religious leader of his day. He killed Christians for a living. When Christianity first pop, popped up among the Jews, they thought it was heresy because they said, number one, no way that that guy was our Messiah. Number two, no way that a man could be justified outside of the law. Number three, no way the Gentiles who eat bacon, eat ham, work on the Sabbath, do all that, could be just as safe as we are. So the New Testament that we enjoy sounded like heresy to them. So Saul of Tarsus was a man who made it his business to try and shut Christianity down when it first started because he thought it was a, a heretical doctrine. Do you understand that? He killed Christians for a living. Well, one day he met the Lord on the way to a town called Damascus and the Lord showed up and shined so brightly, he knocked Paul literally off his high horse and blinded him. 
stopped Paul in his tracks and told him who he was and what he was supposed to do. And from that point, Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle, and he wrote the majority of the New Testament. Do you understand that? Romans, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Some people said Paul wrote Hebrews, uh, Philemon, Titus. Oh, that's Paul. <laughs> that man killed Christians for a living. Met the Lord, and the Lord literally did a 180 in that man's life. And that man that said that Christianity is heresy and can't be true ended up writing the majority of the New Testament Bible. Do you understand that? When Paul first got saved, everybody looked at Paul like he was crazy. They're like, no way are you a Christian. What is wrong with you, man? No way you could be saved. Okay? Finally, fi last example I want to look at is, of course, Jesus' mom, and that is Mother Mary. Uh, all of the stuff happened in Luke chapter 1. I'm not going to read that whole chapter. I'm going to read uh, Mary's response to Gabriel. Mary's response to Gabriel is in Luke 138, where she says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it happen to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Basically, what happened before Jesus was born was that Gabriel came to Mary and told her she was going to be mother of Messiah and told her everything that was going to happen. Mary said, well, I'm a virgin. How's this going to be? That's why right, it says Paul killed Christians. That's right. He killed Christians for a living. Paul was authorized. He was deputized. Paul had legal papers to go in people's houses, and if they were professing Christians, he dragged them out of the house and had them arrested. The man that wrote Romans did that. And Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all that. That's the same guy. Okay? So anyway, so Gabriel told Mary she was going to be mother of the side. And Gabriel told Mary what was going to happen. And Mary was like, I'm a virgin. I don't know a man. And then Gabriel said, the spirit of God is going to plant Messiah in your womb. And then Mary said what I just read in Luke 138, be it unto me. I want you to imagine. Now, first of all, most scholars agree that Mary was somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. So we're going to split the difference and say that Mary, Jesus' mom, was 13. 13 years old by our system, that puts her in eighth grade. I'm just going to let that sink in. Jesus came in, into this world through the, the womb of an eighth grader. Okay, yeah. just let that sink in. I want you to imagine how Mary was literally taking her life into her hands by agreeing to that assignment because Mary was engaged to Joseph. Engagements back then meant much more than they do now. And so the Bible said that Joseph was going to get rid of her once she told him that she was pregnant. But Joseph had a, a cultural right to actually take Mary to the middle of town and have her stoned. That's why, because she was she appeared to be unfaithful, but she wasn't. She was believing God. So I want you to imagine an eighth grade girl that had a boyfriend and a fiance that broke up with her because she came up pregnant. But she's like, Joseph, I didn't do anything. I'm still a virgin. I swear to you, I didn't cheat on you. I promise you, this is not what it looks like. And Joseph's like, yeah, Mary, whatever. Joseph could have had her killed. Do you see that by Mary agreeing to become Jesus's mom, she was taking her life in her hands, literally. Okay, so you can't tell me that Mary didn't look crazy, and you can't tell me that Joseph didn't look crazy because what happened when Joseph had to tell his parents that I'm gonna marry Mary anyway? Can you imagine that conversation? Joseph just told him that Mary pregnant, and he knows it's not his because he didn't sleep with her. And Mary claiming she didn't cheat, whatever she got impregnated by the Holy Ghost, whatever. You can't tell me that didn't sound crazy. And Joseph sitting up there telling his parents. I'm going to marry that girl anyway. His father's like, what'd you say, son? I said, Mary, my girlfriend, I'm going to marry anyway. I thought you just said she was pregnant. She is. That's not your baby, right? No, it's not. You need to have that girl stone. That girl don't have no right to marry you. Yeah, but the angel appeared to me in a dream and told me to fear not to take her. You can't tell me Joseph didn't look crazy. You can't tell me his parents was like, what'd you say, boy? <laughs> you going <laughs> you gonna to take a girl that cheated on you, got knocked up by some other dude, and instead of stoning her, you're going to marry her. Can you see? I'm just going to let that in. These were real people in real situations, y'all. This is not Bible stories. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. So Joseph and Mary, both of them look crazy. Can you imagine Joseph talking to his friends? And Middle Eastern men don't put up with sexual uh, inappropriateness from women period. They still don't to this day. 
I'm talking this day in in Asia, which you know, Southeast Asia, India. I'm sorry, Southeast Asia, but also in the pure Middle East, they don't put up with sexual inappropriateness, anything for females. They kill women, they stone women, they burn women alive. I'm talking about now. I'm not talking about Bible times. I'm talking about right now. That's what Joseph had a right to do. And he said in the face of all that, he said, I'm going to marry her. You can't tell me that both Joseph and Mary didn't look crazy. So what's my point? The point is what the Holy Ghost wanted me to communicate to the saints on today that there are so many circumstances and situations you might find yourself in where you are called by God to do something out of the norm, off the beaten path, hasn't been seen before, or maybe there's mistakes you haven't made yet like David and God called you anyway. And God knew you was going to make their mistakes when he called you. Maybe you have a past like Moses. Maybe you have a wild past like Paul. Like you a multiple murderer. You was trying to commit genocide. You was trying to wipe Christians as a group out. That's who Saul of Tarsus was. And that's the man Jesus called to write the majority of the New Testament. So the word, the prophetic word for the day looking crazy is to encourage you that looking crazy is a part of following God. If you're trying to pioneer something, if God has given you, I want you to think about the first time somebody made pants out of denim, what we call blue jeans. You realize that people didn't always do that, right? What do you think about the first person that made pants out of denim? What do you think they said about them? <laughs> they said, are you crazy? <laughs> what do you think about the Wright brothers trying to build an airplane so we could fly? That's what I mean. You might be out there on an entrepreneurial idea. You might be out there on a vision from God. You might be out there on a word from God. You might be out there on something that nobody's ever seen before. You might be the first person in your family to do something. You might come from a family of athletes and you want to be a lawyer. <laughs> you might come from a family of dancers and God called you to be an evangelist. You might come from a family where all your sisters got married and had their kids early in their teens and 20s. You might have just gotten married. You're trying to have babies in your 40s and 50s. You might be the only woman in your family that's done that. There's all kinds of scenarios that we can find ourselves in. But if you are following God, there is no way that at some point you're not going to look crazy. I stopped by to tell you that the Spirit of God is trying to encourage you to don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, be encouraged. Stand on the Word of God. Stay your course because there are going to be generations. I'm, I'm going to say it one more time. The thing that started this whole faith thing for Jews and Christians was a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman having a baby. Also, did you know that Abraham and Sarah were brother and sister? Abraham and Sarah had the same dad, different moms. Did you know that? <laughs> I know they never talk about that kind of stuff in church. Okay? So here's a 100-year-old man married to his half-sister having a baby at 100. She 90. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what started your faith. That's why you saved, because of that couple right there. Here's Mary and Joseph, a 13-year-old virgin in the Middle East, got pregnant by faith and not by laying with a man, couldn't convince her boyfriend. Gabriel had to talk to Mary and Joseph, and both of them had to turn their backs on what their family thought. What would your family think if you pregnant in eighth grade? What would your family think if it looked like your girlfriend cheated on you and you said, I'm going to marry her anyway? Can you see it? Those, those are the first families of the Bible. Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. You understand that? So there is no way for you to follow God and not look crazy sometimes. So I want you to be encouraged and not discouraged. And the Holy Ghost wanted to let you know that if you're out there on a vision from God, stay the course. Don't give up. They're going to talk about me. Yes, they are. So what? They're not going to like me. No, they won't like you. So what? Well, ain't nobody ever did nothing like that before. That's why God called you the pioneer. Did you ever think about that? 
you got to stop looking with people vision. You got to start looking with God vision. Don't you know that there are some things that God is trying to get on the earth? Don't you know that's exactly the Lord's point? That there's some stuff he's trying to get on the earth? Don't you understand that? So if God has called you to get out there and do something that the world has never seen before, something you never thought you could do, something nobody in your family has done, something that you think or other people think your past doesn't qualify you to do. I know, I know Sister McGillicuddy ain't calling herself no pastor. You talking about Corrine McGillicuddy? Uh-huh. I knew her when she was hot in fish grease. She talking about she a pastor, Pastor McGillicuddy. Uh-huh. Well, just because people talk, talk about you like that, if you have a past, God is still calling you to do what he's telling you to do now, because if the Lord hasn't given up on you, if the Lord gave you the green light, then go forward and do what God has called you to do. Because yes, they're going to talk about you, and yes, they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. Remember that King David hadn't done adultery and murder when God anointed him king. That was in his future when God called him. Think about it. And God called him anyway. You know what that means? That means God believes in you. God believes in you just like he believed in David. God believes that you're going to get the, the job done, and that's what he wants. There's something he's trying to birth into the earth. That's why he put it in your heart. That's why you feel so pressed to do it. That's why maybe you spent some time in your life doing other things, and you found out, I can't be happy doing them other things. I got to do what the Lord called me to do. Can you see it? All right. So be encouraged. Don't be discouraged, okay? Stay the course. Stand on God's word. Give birth to whatever God called you to give birth to, whether it's an actual baby or a ministry or portfolio or business, entrepreneurship, a book, what a nation, whatever it is God is calling you to give birth to, no matter your age or stage of life. If the Lord called you to do it, I don't care how crazy you look, you in good company. Noah, Mary, Paul, David, you in good company, Joseph, you in good company if you out there in the will of God looking crazy. All right? Amen and amen. All right, that's prophetic word for this week. Let me see if there's anything else the Holy Ghost wants me to release. Okay, I think that, that's it. Amen and amen. All right, I will be back now this Thursday. Let me see. Yeah, uh, this Thursday is the second Thursday. Uh, so it's time for No More Genies. Uh, the internet and stuff has been just crazy for me for the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to be on here live Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. If I'm late, just wait for me. I'm coming. If not, I'll upload the video. But one way or another, we'll make it happen. Okay? Just like we did today, out there doing a prophetic word in front of Starbucks. <laughs> I don't care if they think I'm crazy. What I care about is did I do what God told me to do? Because when I die, and God calls me to account as a prophet. God is not going to ask me, did they like you? God is not going to ask me, did people think you were crazy, David? That ain't what he's going to ask me. He's going to ask me, did you do what I told you to do? And I want to be able to say yes. Okay? So be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. I'll be here Thursday, one way or the other. And I'll be here next Sunday, one way or the other, for the weekly live prophetic word. So uh, if you want to bless me financially, my cash out, you know, my cash out. A dollar sign DMT2. If you want to, uh, what else I want you to do is uh, like and share this so other people can watch it. Because remember, other people need to hear, because other people need this encouragement. There's other people out there today looking and feeling crazy, wondering if they're doing the right thing, trying not to give up. So please share this video. Please let them know that the Spirit of God released the word to let them know that they're not crazy. They're supposed to be, if God told you to do it, you're supposed to do it, no matter what your age or stage. Okay? All right. Amen, amen. God bless. Have a good week. Uh, stay strong. And I will see you Thursday, and I will see you Sunday. Amen, amen. And don't worry about looking crazy.